Right, so my lightning talks about speaking to government about mental health. Uh, mental health is uh, a rising challenge uh, in, in the world today. Um, few of us will go through life without any impact uh, from uh, mental wellness in our lives. Uh, so mental health needs are rising throughout the community. Uh, the rates of depression and anxiety are, are orders of magnitude greater now than what they were a generation or two ago. We're seeing things like imposter syndrome, uh, burnout uh, rising significantly. Uh, in Australia, suicide is the leading cause of death for people under the age of 45. Um, we also have traditional mental illnesses such as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. 30 years ago, some people felt that's all mental illness was, but now we understand it's much broader than that. Uh, our community is changing. Two generations ago, you could expect to go to school and get an education, and then at the end of that education, go get a job, and then work in that job until you retire 30 years later. And that's the extent of, uh, of what you need to do. Now we're reskilling throughout our working lives. We might work four, five, or even more careers. Our physical environment is very different. Bef uh, there used to be, it used to be very structured. We used to have um, a lot of social um, uh, constructs, such as clubs or religion, uh, or various ways where we'd, we'd be interacting with the same kind of people for an extended period of time. But uh, now, um, now that's in a great, straight, um, a great uh, state of flux. Um, uh, when it comes to clubs and communities, fewer and fewer people uh, are engaging in such things. So our relationships are becoming much more transitory. Even in the work environment, we may be working remotely and not uh, work and connecting with people on that one-to-one -one basis. And social networks are a poor replacement for that individual whites of the eyes connection. So in response, the Victorian government in Australia is, has a commission about what a modern mental health system should look like. And uh, I've been encouraged, among with others, is this is the time to communicate to government about what uh, a mental health system should look like. Um, and some of the ideas that we have to, to put into that submission are, are concepts of mental wellness so not just waiting until we actually are depressed or have a level of anxiety that, that puts us out of control, but how do we stay in a good place? A number of talks at Django Cons over the past have looked at things like um, uh, imposter syndrome uh, and how do we personally manage that. But sometimes these issues can be beyond what we can just personally manage. How does the state help us? Um, I've been looking at schema therapy and that uh, is effective in situations where cognitive behavioural therapy has proven to be ineffective. There's been exciting uh, research looking at psychedelics and how they can really uh, affect change. Uh, one particular study with Rick Doblin has been looking at MDMA uh, with uh, um, soldiers that have been suffering from PTSD. So there's lots of things out there um, but Government often isn't aware of these things, or if they are, it's disconnected. So there's an opportunity to talk. And the, what's going on in Victoria has been watched by other states in Australia. It's been watched by governments here in the United States. So it's a bit of a, um, it's a, bit of a template for, um, for what may be an effective mental health system going forward. So it is time to talk. And so what I'm doing is I'm preparing a submission to the Royal Commission and, um, and my invitation is while we're at this conference, if you've got ideas, come and talk to me. If your ideas are significant enough, you might wish to consider putting your own submission into the Royal Commission. You don't need to be from Australia or for Victoria to actually do this. Anyone in this room can put a submission in. So that's the opportunity. Um, talk to me or make your own submission to the Royal Commission. Uh, they're going to do an interim report next month, and so the uh, plan is to submit into between the interim and the final reports. And that's about it. Thank you, Wayne. My name is Ayaz Amlani. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I love Python. 
I've been coding for about four years, using Python as my first real language, not like a markup language or design language. So <laughs> um, what I'm going to be doing is actually doing a live demo with you guys, going and grabbing data from an API. A lot of you guys, your first time here, you're going to be grabbing data from Django REST framework views. You need to understand what an API is, how to get these objects from an API, and how to display them in your views. So you can actually follow along with me if you'd like. We're going to start by going to Google, and you can type in Bitcoin price API, and that's what we're going to get today. You can grab a link. This is the Bitcoin price. It'll give you an API endpoint. I'm using a free program called Postman just to make this look nice for you. And in Postman, you can grab an API and you can say, I want to view this in actual JSON data, which is what you would normally do. And you can see that these are the keys that you'll want. So if we want to get this price of Bitcoin, we're going to need to be able to say, okay, hey, we need the BPI USD rate. These are the keys you'll need to get this data, which is what we're doing in this live demo. Let's get started. <laughs> so first, we'll need a URL. And actually, first, we'll need to import our libraries. So there are two libraries you're going to need when you're working with these projects. One is called Requests. OK, this is really easy to install. You can look it up. It says pip install requests. Pretty, pretty simple. Um, once you pip install requests, you have it. JSON comes included with Python. It's the second library you'll need. Import JSON. This comes included with Python. You just have to import it. Okay? With JSON, there are two functions that you'll mainly need. These are dumps and loads. Dumps takes an object and turns it into a string. Loads takes a string and turns it into a JSON object that you can now play with in Python. All right? So let's do this. First, we're going to take our URL and save it as a string that we're going to access. Oops, sorry. Then we're going to do a requests.get to get this URL. If I can type. Then we're going to say our data is going to be equal to that content, page.content, which is just like a string version of this page of this API data. So if I print this page right now, this data, you'll see I'll just get a string, but I won't be able to do anything with it. Um, it'll just return to me the string with all of the data that you saw here. Not very pretty. So how can I play with the string data? I just literally have to load it into JSON. JSON.loads my, my string. And now I have a Python object that I can play with. And so if I want to grab something here, I just put in the keys. And I can look. The keys that I need are BPI, USD, rate. So let's do that. Uh, BPI, USD, rate. And I should now just get the price. So I just grabbed data from an API within less than five minutes in a live demo. You guys can do this too, especially if it's your first time here at DjangoCon. I encourage you to go back and do this on your own. Practice. This is what I teach my students at home. Um, and um, I tried to do it beforehand. And yeah, it looks like I was able to do it just fine. So these are the same steps that you're going to take every single time. Okay. So all you really need to do is like save all this in a function and pass a URL. And you can do this over and over and over again. Um, I hope that you can see how easy it was, and this gives you the confidence to do it on your own if you've never done it. If you have any questions, I probably have like 30 seconds to a minute. Um, feel free now. Nothing? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can, you can use request to just put it in a JSON too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And a lot of um, libraries, like I believe like Django comes with its own HTTP.request library. You can even say just return it in JSON format. The only reason I didn't do that is because a lot of times these API endpoints are not API endpoints that you're getting data from. You're just getting data from a website and you're scraping it, so you need the JSON library to do that. Okay, thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Welcome to Django content. <laughs>
it's basically making my job a lot easier. So thank you to the guys who write Django. My, my boss thanks you also. Um, I needed to be, I had two goals. One, I needed to be able to get my site backed up because the last thing I need is that data going away. The other thing was is I needed to get production data into my development environment so I could actually test this. Um, so I wrote something to wrapped around dump data. So I agree. Uh, and if you guys know of a way around this that doesn't require doing shell, this only works on Linux. And I'm interested if you guys want me to actually put more data into time into this. Um, basically, this is how you wrap around the dump data uh, command inside of Django. Um, I'm indenting it because I'm human. I cannot read JSON data when it's a giant blob. I also had a requirement because like imposed on myself that it can't be one whole file. I've had incidents where one part of the out of my application that has tons of data doesn't have to be restored or I don't want to import it and wait for that. So I have it, this thing dump each model out of each application one at a time into its own JSON file. Um, the backup model here um, does that. So it will take in uh, the target, which is the dotted notation of the model and the time, so it can save that to the file name. Um, and that's pulling from this loop here. Um, basically, it loops through every application. If I blacklist a, a uh, app inside of Django, usually because I'm not using those, those tables, I can then save each file out to a folder. The folder then, uh, I also have to, for some odd reason, I don't know why, auth and auth token and content types, which often content types are Django native apps for the authentication and content type I believe is part of um, the migrations. Um, do not like me breaking them down. Um, then after that, there is a, I copy out my media folder because not all data is in the actual database. Um, then I tar it all up, remove what I saved out, and yes, I have a bad habit of doing exception as the print E, because this is caught by the utility that shells into my, my box and says, run the backup. Um, I do register it as a task within Django itself, and I need to put in a document on how to actually, or, so this is a management command. Um, and I've been using this for the last three months, getting data off of my server and into a tape backup without having to pay a license for Commvault. Uh, what I will do is I'll dump this gist into the general channel on Slack. If you wanna have a question or right now this only works on Linux, but I'm willing to actually put in some time to get it to run on Windows or Mac if you guys are interested. Thoughts, questions? It's one of those cra those technical depth things that, that will, will come back and bite you in the rear end. Mm -hmm. Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> How many people understood that? Couple, oh yeah, I'm speaking Mandarin Chinese, awesome. Now, the problem is most people didn't understand that because we need translations in our apps to be able to understand when we don't know the language. Sorry, a little finicky there. Uh-oh. 
Okay, so a full introduction. My name is Andy Knight. You may also know me as Pandy or the Automation Panda. And you might be wondering why, oh, come on. You may be wondering why I'm speaking to you in Chinese. Well, my family is from China. Uh, here's a picture of myself with my wife in the middle and her mom. Uh, this is taken in Shandong province. They're from China, they speak Mandarin. Why does this apply to Django? Well, we have a little bit of a story. My wife and her mom, oh, come on. <laughs> Technical difficulties. So my wife and her mom run an export business where we ship stuff to China. And they were struggling to keep up their orders. So I developed a Django application for them where I used the admin with the data models to show their full order processing and state and all the stuff that has to go with the orders. Django's wonderful, I love it, that's why I'm here today because I started Django with that project. Oh my gosh. I hope this isn't being recorded. So, <laughs> um, so I used Django's admin site. I host it on Heroku. It's still being used today. We can take images and put them in Amazon S3. So awesome. But the problem is English is not Chinese. And I speak English. I speak just a very, very little bit of conversational Chinese. My wife speaks both English and Chinese. But Mama, she does not speak English at all. Yet we all have to use this application for the business. So the solution is let's translate the entire application between English and Chinese. Oh, not now, there we go. No. Oh boy, okay. So I'll show you the application here. It is on the screen mess. So uh, let me get it a little bigger here. So this is just the basic Django admin site and Chinese export order system. If I go to something like orders, we can see all of the orders, but most of this stuff is in English, right? I found a way that you can actually translate the Django admin, and I create a cool little, little widget here at the top where I can click the flag, and boom, everything's in Mandarin. Look at this. So awesome. Um, it's a little bit of a trick to get uh, translations working in the admin for any language, not just Chinese. Uh, you have to make sure that you do translation strings on all of your models. That's the big thing. Uh, the admin does provide some basic translations on its, on its core pages, which is really nice. But um, if I look at one of these orders, right, you can see all the fields themselves are in Mandarin. And if I ever need to switch back to English, because let's say now I'm looking at this, I have, I have no idea what any of this is. <laughs> I can change back and be like, oh, this is the customer, and this is the status, and this is all the cool stuff. So if you want to learn how to do this yourself, I've written a blog article on automationpanda.com. It's called Django Admin Translations. I'll show you how to do full translations of the entire app, as well as parts for the admin, in addition to that cool flag little widget at the top. So again, my name is Pandy. Thank you for listening to my awesome story of how I use Django to help my family solve a business problem. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at automationpanda.com. And if you want some cool panda stickers, come find me sometime during the conference. Thank you. <laughs>
And I scroll down here and I found Python 1.0.1, which was uploaded here in 2002, but actually came out in uh, the 90s. So all I need to do is make a really small patch, actually just change one function, and I was able to get this to compile on the latest version of Ubuntu. So with a small Docker file like this, I can inherit from Ubuntu, install some necessary dependencies, download the source, apply my patch and make and configure it, and then I execute a Python command and I get a REPL. I get a Python shell, and I actually get root, so I'm like, hacked, awesome, cool. Uh, the fun thing about this Python version, though, is it's so old that it doesn't have the double dash version flag. So I can't actually show you which version it is, but trust me, <laughs> it's 101. Uh, yeah, who knows? But the Python REPL works, and it's really cool, and you can see it's Python 101 there. And the thing about this, though, oh, it doesn't have the base HTTP server, HTTP server at all, because it didn't exist yet in this version of Python. So what I did is I went back to this page, 1.3 instead, because I didn't feel like backporting, which happily came out in 2002 instead of 2001, I don't understand why. Again, a patch, again, a Docker file, again, I get root. Version still doesn't exist, but I can import base HTTP server, which is awesome, internet. So <laughs> with that, you can write something that kind of, if you squint at it, looks like a Flask app, but really it's using this little handler thing to write, do a, do a git. And here it says hello from Python and includes sys.version. And then I just run that forever. And then I build a Docker base image. So you put these on Docker Hub. So you, you have Docker base images that give you this version of Python for 1.0.1 .1 to 1.3. Cool. So then I can write another Docker file that inherits from that base image, copies my app in, runs it on a specific port, and runs the app. So it does all those things. Runs on port, runs the app. And with just those two files, Docker file and app.py, I can first build my image with gcloud, so it does a bunch of stuff, and eventually it says success, but like, is it really those success? And then I can deploy it to cloud run with this command, and then I get a URL, and I can go and visit that URL, and it says hello from Python 1.3. Hooray, we did it. We saved Python 1.3. So we can run a serverless runtime with Python 3 now. Uh, so here's some links if you're interested in doing something like this. I will say, you probably don't want to try this at home. Uh, try it at work instead. So. <laughs> Thanks, I'm Dustin. Hi, I'm Paul. So I made this little um, pet project that combines Django filter with uh, this little JavaScript plugin called Data Tables. So, why would you want to combine Django filter and data tables.js, you may ask? It's a great question. Well, the answer is Django filter is awesome, and data tables is awesome but there's, there wasn't a really clear way for me to combine them. So I built a way. So in my demo project, I have a silly little model that just first name, last name, some Rolodex fields, and I created like 10,000 records here. And normally, if you were to build this with Django filter and try to render everything, it would obviously take too long to display it on the page. So, <clears throat> Data Tables has this Ajax feature where it will do pagination, among other things. And so, in my demo project, I have a view. I don't know, where's, where's everything? I have a view that will take the, val take the response that datatables.js gives to you, and then query the data that you want and send it back 
in the format that it's expecting in JSON. So just to give you an idea, this is some of the stuff you have to do to initialize data tables. And right here is the URL, my endpoint. And to kind of tie this all together, I have a little bit of JavaScript here. And all the JavaScript does is take any values that you put in these fields, packages it up into uh, the initialize function. So data tables knows what to do with it. So that's all I got for you. If uh, you find this interesting, here's the link to it. Thanks. <laughs>
we, I do Django first, and then I did JavaScript, so you know. Um, and security, security, security. So we have a highly vulnerable population. Currently, the co um, code is closed, and we are sprinting on it, so I will give you access to that. Um, and then once the security uh, uh, is all covered, then we can open it up, because it's just a very highly vulnerable population. Um, and we've also added black on there. Um, so these are the things, if any of those sound like your skill sets, uh, please come and see me, and you can also Twitter at me. Um, and yeah, here's one of my, one of my tweets. Um, so we are welcome with uh, first timers. I mean, documentation is a thing that we need to do. So all levels will be incredibly valuable, and I'm just a very thankful person. And I just, you know, uh, yeah. Oh, and we are karaokeing at the Hive after reception. We haven't picked a time. Please uh, join the Slack and look at the uh, gathering social channel thing. And I'll be singing something. I'm not so well, but you know, it'll happen. Happen. And I'll embarrass myself, and you can embarrass yourself with me. Anyway, that's me. Uh, thank you. Okay.